Hello, this is Peter Bell, and I'm here with Mr. Tony Baresi from Triumph Gold. Hello, Tony. Hello, Peter. Thanks for uh, thanks for coming to see me. <laughs> Wonderful. I saw you speak earlier this week at Roundup, and was very impressed. Um, I, would, I think I was actually able to follow most of your talk and learned a couple things. Thank you for making it simple. Oh, it was my pleasure, and you know, it was really great to to have been invited by AMEBC to to uh, speak at Roundup. It's like, when I first started my my doctorate, I remember talking to uh, the the BC geologists that were uh, that were. Uh, sponsoring my thesis, and I said, maybe one day I'll get to present this research at Roundup. And they sort of looked at each other, and the, then they they smiled and said, well, probably not. So uh, I'm finally there. Nice. Congratulations. <laughs> well, and you're there talking about what is the largest and um, most intense soil anomalies, too. That layer of information I had missed in the past about the story. Um, quite the history to it. Yeah, so I mean, our Free Gold Mountain property has an awful lot of, of different mineralized areas on it, but one of the most interesting mineralized areas um, it underlies a six kilometer multi element soil anomaly. And the soil anomaly is very intense. The, the bullseyes on it are over a gram gold and over a percent copper, and, and it's multi-element. It's gold, silver, copper, and molybdenum, the kind of thing you would expect to see with a porphyry system. And within that soil anomaly are two of the areas that have seen a lot of previous exploration, and there's actually two resources developed there. And there was always the thought that the overall soil anomaly was basically just leakage from those two deposit areas and soil dis and dispersion of the soil yep. across the area. But what we've discovered in the last two years is that it's actually underlain by an in-situ hydrothermal system, porphyry-related, across the entire six-kilometer range of mountains. <laughs> and if you take a look at a picture of where the soil anomaly is, it is actually encompassing a range of mountains. And there's five spurs that come down off of that mountains, and there's four creeks. And those creeks are each past or current producing plaster deposits of locally derived gold. Wow. Legendary. <laughs> Funny so, you would say that because one of the creeks is actually legendary. It's Revenue Creek, and that's an aptly named creek because it's well known for having been the rich, having had the richest placer channel in all of the Dawson Range. And I've got some pictures I'll show you <laughs> of uh, of the the payouts yep. um, for or from one of the cleanups, yep. and it's a cleanup like nothing you'll see on any of those TV shows that are out there right now. Like this thing is outrageous. <laughs> Any PGMs in the mix ever? No, not. No. Thank you. Yep. Good. And so much to say about it all. Um, hearing you speak at Roundup again, what you had said about 2014, the three resource estimates that were done, and then kind of starting from scratch after that in 2016, that was another thing that just made such an impression on me. Um, what a bold decision. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of hard to turn your back on, you know, millions of ounces of gold and hundreds of millions of pounds copper that are, are in a resource. But when when resources don't demand a capital investment, yeah. if there's still exploration potential, then that's what requires your attention. Yep. And it, it it's hard to not want to just keep on poking away at those resources. Um, but in our case, we've got a district scale property. It's 34 kilometers from end to end. It's 200 square kilometers in total area. And the Big Creek Fall, which is a really important regional control on mineralization. It's one of the controls on mineralization at the coffee deposit about 90 kilometers to the northwest of us. Yep. Um, it runs through our whole property. So there's all kinds of reason to believe that there would be exploration potential. And when we dove deep into the geology, we, we found that there were a, a whole bunch of really important exploration opportunities. So it was a, it was a good move in the end, but it, it's not an easy thing to do. Yeah. 
Well, and, and the way you explained um, one of the cartoons in the presentation there, um, the dietary breccia that was thought to be one thing and turned out to be another, and uh, rethinking some of those 2011 holes, that was another piece of the puzzle there. I thought, yes, I'm very glad to hear about exploration team rethinking. <laughs> this is good. Yeah, so many projects are just, you know, an evolution of ideas. And I, I don't fault the previous technical teams on this property at all. They did an amazing job of figuring out a lot of things. And we're basically just building on that. Yeah, which is an interesting twist on it too, right? You think, oh, turn your back on these old resource estimates. It's like, well, no, they're still there. Thank you very much. <laughs> That's right. And and for instance, you know, when when... It, they were exploring the when the past technical teams were exploring the property between 2006 and 2012 um, they were discovering the nucleus epithermal gold deposit and, and they had had intersections that were <laughs> over a hundred grams gold um, and they had a whole bunch of occurrences of visible gold and they were hitting high grade gold all over the place yep. and that's the kind of results that you've got to follow up and yep. they did and they followed it up and it culminated with a resource that ended up not being as high grade as it needed to be to demand a capital investment at the current gold prices um, but that was exploration that was definitely warranted and if we started hitting that kind of stuff someplace that hadn't been explored we'd be following it up like crazy too. <laughs> There, I recall you saying something about seeing visible gold in some of the recent drilling um, and seeing it kind of more concentrated than you might have expected, is that? Yeah, so <clears throat> this summer was a pretty amazing summer. We had some really high grade mineralization in a place that nobody had explored before on the property. and. You know, when you're finding this kind of stuff, you've, you've got to keep it under your hat. You can't tell anyone. <laughs> but when I was away from the property, if anyone ever found any visible gold, their first job was to take a picture of it and send it to me in an email with the message VG alert. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and those are pretty fun emails to get. And <laughs> I was getting emails like that two, three times a day for oh. weeks on end. Really? Yeah, it was pretty hard to contain myself during that period of time. Wow. And what's going on here is that we've got a, a sort of typical porphyry system that's got a lot of copper and an above average amount of gold associated with that copper. And that's gold that you never see. It's too fine grained, it's inside of the calcopyrite. But that is overprinted by a late set of quartz carbonate veins that have polymetallic mineralization, so there's lead and zinc in these things, and an incredible amount of visible gold within these veins. Mm. And these are a kind of vein that are more typically dispersed very broadly and diffusely around porphyry systems. Yep. And we see a little bit of these veins diffused broadly around this porphyry system, but they're concentrated right within the guts of the thing. So they're important in upgrading the gold values within this thing. And that's why we're seeing so much visible gold when we're drilling through it. Mm. And this comes back to that cartoon again of what they chased in the past and what you're looking at now. That's right. So what we're looking at now is, is outboard of um, previous areas of exploration. So there was um, a diatreme, which is the root of a highly explosive volcano. The revenue diatreme has all kinds of mineralization, mostly around the edge of it. Yeah. But what we discovered was that the revenue diatreme was emplaced into a pre-existing mineralized system. And that was a system that had not seen previous exploration. And that was the main focus then of our exploration in 2017 and 18. And really, it's what led to the successes that we've been having. Yeah, and some of these headline successes to hear you and John Anderson talking about the best holes in the best porphyry in the Yukon, um, 
may sound, you know, and to hear you talk about it at Roundup, you're saying, oh, it's not just bluster, you know, there's a Yukon GS uh, geological survey report in 2018 helping back this up. Um, that's all good, but one of the things that stuck with me from Roundup was that there's not that many porphyry deposits known um, within range of the surface in the Yukon. <clears throat> that's right. Uh, so there... The Yukon's not well known for having a lot of porphyries. Uh, the Casino porphyry is definitely the most well-known porphyry system in, in Yukon. Uh, and it's um, much lower grade than the intersections that we've been making of this blue sky porphyry. Yeah. There are quite a few other porphyry prospects and showings, uh, basically between us and Casino, uh, and a few other little ones around. but. Um, for the most part, in order to have a porphyry um, style deposit, you need to have an intrusion come to very high crustal levels. And of the fertile intrusions in Yukon, uh, most of the ones that we see are either have not made it to high crustal level, or if they did make it to high crustal level, that part of them is now eroded. So if there ever was a porphyry system there, it's gone. And that's really the reason why there's not many porphyry systems in Yukon. But on our property, we have a, a very specific geological environment that allowed an intrusion to come to very high crustal level. And that's why it's so perspective for porphyry and is why we're discovering porphyry. And was there some any thoughts on the cap that would have kept the volcano from exploding? Or and you're talking about the diatreme as well. I wonder all the history there. It sounds like active area. Yeah. So the porphyry did explode. Okay. And that's the diatreme. Yeah. The diatreme is the last thing that that intrusion ever did. It blew its top <laughs> and it erupted as a giant explosive volcano and it never caused another stitch of mineralization after that. Um, but before it blew its top, yeah. it did just exactly what you need a porphyry system to do. It kept on cracking the rock around it and putting a bunch of veins out into it with a bunch of metal and causing the rock to become well mineralized. And who knows what would have happened if that diatreme hadn't busted the top off mm. of the thing. We might be in an even better system. Yeah. Um, but we're quite happy with what we've got, though. <laughs> and this is the blue sky porphyry. This is the one we're talking about. Well, actually, <clears throat> I think that um, there's a porphyry intrusion that underlies the entire six kilometer soil anomaly that we have yet to identify. The, what we're calling the blue sky porphyry is not actually associated with a porphyry intrusion that's co-spatial with it. Um, the blue sky porphyry is hosted in rock that's 105 million years old, but the mineralization is 75 million years old. And the reason why it's hosted where it's hosted is because that's ground that has two directions of intersecting faults. So there's a lot of broken and permeable ground there. And that's where the fluids from an underlying intrusion were able to make it up to what's now the surface. And that's why it's mineralized right there. But the real prize here is to get down to the intrusion that caused those fluids. Mm. And in a typical porphyry system, the interface between that intrusion and the surrounding country rock is the area where there's the most continuous and highest grade mineralization. So we don't really think that what we've called the blue sky zone porphyry is anything compared to what remains to be tested. Yeah. And a sense for depth there? Is there any indication yet? Well, just the fact that this entire six kilometer area has a porphyry related hydrothermal system um, continuous across it means that we can't be, t it can't be too deep. Um, because if it was, for instance, two kilometers deep, we wouldn't be having this continuous hydrothermal footprint. It would be too deep for that. Yep. Um, but it's hard to say it 
could be just at the limit of what we've drilled, which is about 450 meters vertical extent, um, or it could be as deep as a kilometer. Um, it's hard to say. We've run some deep penetrating geophysics, and we're just in the very early stages of um, taking a close look at, at the results from that geophysical survey, and that should really bring to light um, what we're looking at for depth. As far as drilling goes next year, we're looking at um, drilling a couple of 1,600 meter deep holes, um, but we want to have the capacity to drill to 2,000 meters because we sure don't want to stop those holes in high-grade mineralization. <laughs> yep, exciting. Uh, these big drill rigs that are capable of going down 2,000 meters, it's amazing stuff. Um, core drilling, I wonder any sense of core, um, the, the size of the core that you'd pull back and whether or not you, I guess you can get the important information you need from relatively small core. That's right. Um, when you're drilling really deep holes, sometimes it's wise to start off with wide diameter core and then progressively do narrower and narrower diameter core. Um, it's just sort of, you know, if you imagine a, uh, you know, those old, old antennas that came off of walkie-talkies, how they yeah. kind of um, yeah. decrease in size as they get longer, and, and that makes it easier to drill. But uh, uh, even if we ended up drilling um, NQ or NTW at the, the deeper levels, that would, that would give us plenty of information. Um, we'd still get a good test of the, of the rock. Yeah, and, and that's because um, we're talking about poor freestyle mineralization at depth, right? That's right, yeah. Wonderful. Looking at this map of the six kilometer area, it was the first time I've seen this big pink <laughs> semicircle you have down at the bottom there. Um, it really conveys the message you're trying to get across. Um, looked impressive up on the stage at Roundup too. I think I uh, heard a few people whispering to each other when you when you first showed that slide and the thing i really love about that is that you know this is just our car cartoon cross section of what we'd like to like to have under there um and people think oh well that's you know complete conjecture and <laughs> and more promotion than science um but i always like following that slide with the slide of the the new um, Yukon Geological Survey map of our property, which also has a cross section through this same area, and they have the exact same thing in their cross section—a big underlying causative intrusion. So you know, we're, we might want to be promotional, but the the YGS is in the business of uh, putting out you know what they really think the geology is like, mm -hmm. and it it mirrors what we've shown exactly. And that 2018 report. That's different from the mapping that was done. No, that's uh, that is the mapping that was done. Okay, thank uh, it, you. It was published in early 2018. The work was done in 2017. Thank you. I wonder if they'll any if there's a, a paper or anything like that or, that they'll publish as well, or if it's just the map, really. Yeah. So uh, there's a, a woman, uh, Melissa Friend. She is a uh, an author on the on the map, and she did publish a, a paper uh, documenting the rock types, and she's uh, doing a master's thesis right now, looking at the geochemistry and geochronology of the rocks across the map area. Uh, and uh, she and I are currently working on a, a paper for a, a CIM volume that's going to uh, discuss the revenue nucleus system as a porphyry system. Wonderful. And going back to your PhD as well, um, metallogeny in this general area of the world as well, as I recall, right? That's right, yeah. More of a focus on uh, on uh, the Hazelton group, which is mainly in, in Stikinia in British Columbia. But yeah, it's sort of uh, definitely uh, analogous to what we're looking at here. Yeah. Well, in dealing with these big crustal scale faults, um, some related concepts, I would think. Absolutely. Uh, it's, uh, it's 
Cordyaran tectonics and metallogeny. Yeah. All the way. And is it a little simpler up there than in some parts of BC, I would think? Um, well, there's nothing simple about doing a PhD. <laughs> yeah. And it was, uh, you know, when you're looking at things on the kind of scale that you look at when you're doing doing a doctorate, it's uh, that was really looking at a belt of rocks all across British Columbia. Wow. And yeah. now sort of picking up from that and moving to a property in Yukon, my, my original focus here was property scale, um, which is uh, in a lot of ways easier to have a, a thorough review of everything that's ever been written about it yep. <laughs> compared to, you know, a province-wide sort of thing. Yep. Um, on the other hand, you know, you're always on different scales. There's different complications. But it was, uh, it was pretty nice to change focus from um, uh, province scale to a 34-kilometer long scale. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, and really the six kilometers within that. Well, that's our main focus for sure. Um, but we've got a bunch of other pipeline projects that we're, we're moving forward as well. And it's sort of fun to spend a few days here and there digging my teeth into some of those. I wonder about some of them. Um, not a lot of time for discussion about that stuff uh, up on stage at Roundup, but there's some in the new presentation here, I see. Yeah, that's right. So, I mean, <clears throat> I can tell you about um, the Irene showing, which is uh, this is a pretty exciting thing that we've uh, been working on developing this year. Um, so, Irene is an epithermal quartz vein uh, that was first discovered, I think, in 2013 uh, during placer mining activities. Uh, and the placer miner called up our geologist and said, hey, I think I found something cool at the bottom of this creek. <laughs> and the geologist went up there and took a look and said, yeah, that's, that's pretty cool. Um, and over the course of two years, there was enough exposed at the bottom of the creek to define an epithermal vein over 140 meters strike length. And they channel sampled that vein uh, all across the, the strike length and, and had multigram gold over multimeters every place that they sampled. Um, so this year, uh, we did the inaugural drill program on that, uh, on that vein system and we tested it over 450 meters strike length and we hit it in every single hole. We had results up to 20 grams gold uh, and in most of the holes we had multi-gram gold over multimeters. Uh, and so that's really interesting, but the really compelling thing about this 450 meter strike length of gold mineralization that we have in Gooder Creek is that this is at the very bottom of a mountain. And if you line that vein up with the top of the mountain, you have an area that saw exploration back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, <laughs> where there's another vein exactly along strike that had very similar grades. So again, there were grades up to, I think about 18 grams gold up there and most of the holes had multi-gram gold over multimeter, multimeters. Now if you line those up from end to end where they've been drilled, the intervening area and those areas combined is about 3.7 kilometers strike length. And not just 3.7 kilometers strike length, but something really interesting is that there's a 500 meter variation in elevation. Now, when you look at most epithermal vein systems, the best mineralization is contained within about a 200 meter envelope of elevation, okay? So there's a very good chance that the drilling that's defined nice epithermal veining at the bottom of the mountain and the drilling that's defined the same thing at the top of the mountain, that these are outside of the well-mineralized envelope that's contained in epithermal systems. We've got 500 meters of elevation change to prospect between these two areas. Yeah. And 
is virtually unexplored except for one trench that's sort of smack in the middle of those two areas. And in that trench, we have a grab sample that graded 425 grams gold. So we're pretty excited about this. And you know, people talk about low hanging fruit. This may be low hanging fruit for us. Yep. And like the strike length of this thing is very significant. The elevation or the variation in vertical extent is extensive. And this is the kind of target like shovel nose in Southern BC and you just have to get into the right part of it and you start getting really good grades. Yep. And the drilling you did in 2018, good work. Um, the last time we talked, I, I don't recall um, if it was clear that you were going to or if it had been done yet. Um, it looks like several holes, too. That's right. Actually, I think we put 11 holes in there, wow. testing 450 meter strike length. Good for you. And, you know, that might seem like a lot, but if you look at what other what our peers in Yukon are, are doing on similar epithermal projects, they're like Swiss cheesing the thing. And, and <laughs> like, <laughs> and like, if you look at the vertical vertigo zone and um, the white gold is, is exploring, they've got much denser drilling. And a lot of the drilling that they have in that zone has results very similar to Irene. Yeah. Um, so we suspect that there's a very good chance that if we did similar density of drilling here, we'd be we'd be intersecting some of the same kind of high grade stuff that they have. That's pure speculation. I mean, it's hard to say, um, but when you increase the density of your drilling, you increase the probability of hitting high grade ore shoots, which is what <laughs> these kinds of things are known to have. <laughs> but the challenge for you is prioritizing things. Um, large property, lots of things to do. Um, was there any other drilling at any other places on the property in 2018? Uh, no, our drilling focused on the areas, the area encompassing uh, revenue and nucleus. And then this was sort of our, our other project on the property for drilling. Um, we and did a fair bit of grassroots work on some of the other prospects on, on Free Gold Mountain. And uh, one of the exciting ones that that we're developing is a porf a very little known porphyry system. It's called the cabin porphyry. Uh, and when I started working for the company, it really was nothing more than just kind of a cross on the map. Uh, and we had to dig pretty deep into work that was done back in the very early 70s, like 71, 72, to find out anything about it. Um, and it turned out that it's, we did a bunch of trenching over it this year and f came up with some really interesting results. It's a dead ringer for being a leached phyllic zone above a mineralized porphyry system. Uh, so this is one of the sort of porphyry pipeline projects ah, that we're working on right now. Wonderful. And looking at the project-wide geological map, um, hearing you talk about the dilation and the big faults and the, the way they've kind of split apart around the revenue nucleus zone, lozenge or something, you some word you were using as I hadn't heard before, but looking at it, it's, it's clear something, uh, some bends and some space created there. Um, Irene as well with quite a few faults uh, indicated and, and cabin to the south, they seem to kind of peter out down there. Um, I don't know if that's just based on what you can see at surface and the mapping so far, but the structural, broad structural aspects of this project area are just <laughs> pretty wild. Yeah, the structural architecture of the Big Creek Fault as it comes through our property is really dynamic and it's responsible for most of the mineralization on the property. And so it's, it's super important to understand the structure and it's much more complicated than what you can see on a regional scale map like what we've got right here. Um, so we're working very closely with uh, the expert structural geologists at Gold Corp. Uh, and we've also, uh, we've also engaged Terrain Geoscience, uh, which is a structural geology um, consultancy company. Uh, and together with them and with the guys at Gold Corp, we're, we're working very hard to understand the structural controls that are going on here. And that's, that's largely, um, it's property wide, but it, it's largely to help us uh, zero in on the controls for mineralization in the revenue and nucleus area. Yeah, wonderful. And coming back to Irene, 
Um, that one grab sample in the trench there, I wonder, uh, drilling versus more surface work. So the entire area between Irene and the Gold Star vein on the top of the mountain is is highly prospective for a continuous continuation of uh, <clears throat> that vein. Uh, I think probably our next step here would be to uh, drill the entire strike length, <laughs> not just under that one sample. Yeah, um, It might be advantageous to try to do that with a, a less expensive drill rig than what we do what we did this year so maybe some rc drilling that yeah. sort of thing to it, it, that way it's sort of more bang for your buck when you're testing um a really large area yeah and there's a creek winding its way through there but um not that rugged terrain in terms of being able to position the rig and stuff yeah i, I think we'd be able to uh put a road i mean there's already a road that is uh, that took us all the way to where we uh, drilled this year. Yeah. Uh, and there's a road on the top of the mountain where uh, uh, it was drilled back in the 70s and 80s, uh, extending those roads, you know, one, one up from the bottom and one down from the top uh, would be logistically pretty simple, I think. Uh, and, and then we'd be able to just drag a drill in. That's one of the great things about this property is that there's an a incredible amount of pre-existing infrastructure. And, that's, and that traces back to the history of it, too. Um, I think I heard you say something like the uh, largest part of the Big Creek Fault, the uh, largest road accessible part, something like this. That's right, yeah. And this area has seen <clears throat> exploration since the 1930s. Wow. Uh, so it's, yeah, it's... There's a lot of uh, people that have been in there building roads and and not just the type of exploration we're doing, but there's been a lot of plaster mining and there's current plaster mining in the area. So that, that helps to uh, maintain the infrastructure. Advanced reconnaissance team. I always like to think of them as something like that. There's not very many places in the world where, you know, you've got people digging up creeks and, <laughs> and telling you about what's underneath them. <laughs> Especially within a legal framework that's above board and, and not illegal or something as well. That's right. Yeah, it's nice to uh, to have a separation between the the surface and the subsurface rights. And so, you know, when those guys find something that's attached to the bedrock, it's they're not allowed to have it, and they're not trying to get it, and <laughs> it makes it very easy for them to cooperate with you or with us. And I wonder. I guess there's lots of unknowns about Irene yet, but the potential for several phases or, or pulses, is that um, potentially in the cards? Yeah, there's at least two types of veins that run through there. There's um, a sort of quartz, arsenopyrite, breccia system, which is sort of very typical of um, an epithermal type vein, the, the boiling of the, the fluids causes a bunch of rebrecciation of, of the rock. And, and then there's these other veins that are um, kind of polymetallic, massive sulfide veins. Uh, and we consider those to be um, sort of two separate but overlapping uh, stages of mineralization along what, what was probably um, or maybe still is a, a fault system. Uh, so, you know, these these fluids are using the, the pre-existing or active fault system as a, a or fluid conduit. And are you seeing both those types at the Gold Star and Irene? Or uh, We see them both at Irene. I haven't looked at the Gold Star core yet, so I can't really say. Great. What an awesome uh, prospect area. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty exciting. And you know, like th this map has Irene and Gold Star on it. Uh, but there's a bunch of other stuff up there that we didn't even put on the map because <laughs> it's not relevant to that story. But right here is the Stoddart Porphyry, um, just like a half kilometer off from oh, this wow. epithermal system. Yeah. And just to the north of Gold Star, there's a uh, Scarn system uh, that had seen quite a bit of exploration. And then to the north of Irene, all along the top of the mountain, there's a bunch of other gold-bearing veins up there. 
Uh, so it's uh, like that's why people were exploring Free Gold Mountain back in the 30s because every rock they broke open had gold in it. <laughs> what a name for a mountain, too. Free Gold, if that doesn't tell exactly, you. Exactly, <laughs> yeah. And I wonder, Tinta. Right, so Tinta is uh, an area that we <clears throat> uh, did some exploration on in, in 2000 and, uh, 2016. Uh, and we, we didn't do any exploration there 2017. We were planning to do some exploration there. Uh, and we were planning to do it at the end of the summer. And we did some First Nations consultation and discovered that uh, it's an important hunting ground for the local Little Salmon Carmax First Nation. Uh, so we decided to de delay our exploration program up there um, so that we weren't interfering with their hunting activities, uh, for which they were most grateful for um, us doing that. And, and we were most grateful for the opportunity to have consultation with them so that we could find out how to best not interfere with their activities. Yep. And we're going back in there this spring probably to do some drilling in 2019. It's oh, probably great. the first place that we're going to hit up. But the thing about Tinta is that there's, there's a defined resource there. Um, with a bunch of drilling through it, and it's a polymetallic vein deposit. And <clears throat> it's defined over about 800 meters strike length. And it's a vein that is thick in the middle, and out towards the edges it tapers off, and then it just disappears. Uh, and there's a few trenches and drill holes along strike of it that validated that, yes, it does disappear. But in 2016, we did a broad soil survey and a VLFEM survey, so a type of geophysics, um, that showed a very strong potential for this vein to reappear a long strike, about 600 meters long strike. Um, and that was in the form of a VLFEM conductor that was coincident with about a kilometer and a half long um, multi-element soil anomaly that was very similar and in places even stronger than the soil anomaly that surrounds the Tinta vein itself. Yeah. So in 2000, at the end of, two, actually in 2017, we, um, we trenched, we put seven trenches across that coincide in anomaly and we found vein material in every single one of those trenches. Some of it had multigram gold, some of it had multi-percent um, copper lead zinc. Uh, and this is in really leached rock that's at the surface. So we don't think it's anything compared to what we're actually gonna hit at depth. <laughs> so now we've got this kilometer and a half long conductor and soil anomaly with validated vein material that contains gold in it over a strike length that's twice as long as the pre-existing Tinta vein. So we're going to get up there this year and test that thing to see if there's the potential to grow the resource there at Tinta. Wonderful. And we're also going to do some drilling on the actual Tinta vein where there were some high-grade historical results in a couple of holes, but the density of the drilling wasn't enough to fill it into the resource very well, and we have some potential to increase the resource um, at Tinted just by doing a bit of infill drilling. Really? With all the holes in that area of the old resource there? That's right. Yeah, there's there's still a few gaps in there that Amazing. would be significant to fill in. Wow. I'm impressed to hear that. <laughs> and it looks like you're up onto the ridge a little bit um, with those trenches. Um, That's right. Yeah, the vein sort of follows the top of uh, the top of Tinta Hill. And speaking of the leaching and things up there, um, I wonder depths um, to get down to some of the fresh rock. Uh, for drilling, it's pretty easy. It's you know tens of meters. Uh, for trenching, it can be difficult. Yeah, certainly. Um, so you know you can you can dig a couple of meters into soft broken rock at most with an excavator, yeah. um, and then it becomes too dangerous to keep on going. So yeah, these trenches are very much still in, um, they're in bedrock, but the bedrock is strongly uh, clay altered from um, meteor or from surface water, 
um, and the for the most part the sulfides are rusted out of it and you just see a bunch of rust and that sort of thing. Surprised to hear only tens of meters and not you know, greater oxidation there. <clears throat> yeah, it's different in in on different parts of the property yeah. uh, and in different parts of the Yukon. So at, at Nucleus, uh, we've found places where we've, we've drilled almost 100 meters vertical extent and we're still getting oxida- oxidation. Um, and, you know, that's something that's, that's in some ways good because uh, if you're looking at recovering gold, if the rock is fully oxidized, then you can just look at a heap leach scenario, and that's what Gold Corp's doing at Coffee and what uh, uh, Victoria Mines is doing at Eagle. And so there's some potential for that sort of thing on, on this property. It, it would be nice if Tinto was, was like that, um, but it's not. <laughs> and I wonder, Tad Toro, a big picture here. Is this, <clears throat> I don't recall seeing this name marked on the project map. No, so Tad Toro is not part of the Free Gold Mountain property. It's a different property that we have. Um, it's located uh, also along the Big Creek Fault uh, to the northwest of the Free Gold Mountain property. Uh, currently, this property is not a road accessible property, but part of what makes it really exciting is that uh, the, uh, there's government infrastructure funding that's supposed to um, help create a road that's going to go all the way up to casino and when that road is created it will go right through this property so this is a property that's seen on and off exploration for about 30 years uh, and there's quite a few very interesting results from the property there's a lot of epithermal gold potential porphyry potential uh, and it's the kind of property that you know it it's really exciting, but not as exciting as it's going to be when you can drive right onto it instead of spending a bucket load of money on <laughs> helicopters. Yes. Wow. It, amazing. <laughs> Speechless, Tony. <laughs> one of the, another one of our properties, really, we have three properties, the Free Gold Mountain property, yeah. Tad Toro, and another property that is called Andalusite Peak. And this is one that sort of a personal project of mine. Um, it's I, I staked this as open ground back in uh, 2017. And it was actually exactly this time of year when I staked it because I was at a talk by Bram Van Stratton, uh, who's a BC uh, geological survey geologist. And he had just given a talk at Roundup about a, a 27 kilometer long alteration belt just to the east of Dee's Lake that he had uh, he had just completed a bunch of mapping around and he had defined this belt Uh, and the belt had three big alteration blowouts um, one of which was uh, Kaizen Discovery's Tanzilla property so uh, a Friedland company Uh, and the other one is uh, McBride which is owned by Tech and they're both off on the edges of the alteration belt, but right smack in the middle of the alteration belt, there was a big blowout that was completely unstaked. So I just staked it. Mm. Um, and in 2017, we went and, and spent two days on the property, mostly mapping that big alteration zone. Uh, and in that alteration zone, we found a whole bunch of really high temperature, awesome alteration, but we didn't find any mineralization at all, not zero. But the helicopter let us out just to the south of the alteration zone. And there we found a whole bunch of high-grade copper-bearing veins that that were loaded with boronite and calcasite. (laughs) And, you know, I'd seen things like that in the region, and I didn't think that much about them until we got the assay results back. (laughs) And they had multigram gold in them. Mm And so you start looking at multi-gram gold and multi-percent copper, and all of a sudden things start looking more interesting. But that's in an area where we had <clears throat> literally only spent maybe an hour out of two days' work. So we went back there in 2018, revisited that zone, 
we defined a 500 meter, 550 meter long strike length of the extent of that style of mineralization, collected a bunch of samples that had multi-gram or multi-percent uh, copper and a few that had really nice gold grades. And then we flew the next day to the next ridge over, yeah. uh, which is about a kilometer and a half away. And on that ridge, we defined a 1.1 kilometer trend of the same style of mineralization. And where the ridge widens into a plateau, we collected high grade samples on either side of that pla plateau, 300 meters apart from one another. And we collected some real whoppers up there. So we ended up with a sample that was only half a gram gold, but it had 67% copper and 500 grams silver. And people say to me, oh, what'd you do, scrape some malachite into a bag? But that's not what I did. This was a kilogram and a half. Uh, the, the sample weighed a kilogram and a half, and I still have some big chunks of it, and it includes wall rock. Um, and it was just the intersection of two veins and a bit of a blowout, and it was really nice looking stuff. So what do you do with this? Like these veins in and of themselves are not something that you're probably going to mine or use as a, um, or, or explore for in and of themselves. But what we're really excited about with this property is it looks like we're building the elements that you want to see that surround a very fertile porphyry system. So we've got an advanced argillic alteration zone that's a blowout that's part of a large belt. It has the highest temperature alteration anywhere along the 27 kilometer long belt. And then we have these veins are basically propylitic alteration, which is another type of alteration shell you see around porphyry systems. Yep. And within this por propylitic zone, we have the highest grade and most extensive mineralization anywhere in the 27 kilometer long belt, including the stuff that's in McBride or in Tech and Kaizen Discovery's ground. And the whole thing is underlain by a big uh, mat regional mag high, which makes it look like there's probably an oxidized intrusion under there. So we're piecing together the early stage elements that lead people into porphyry discoveries. And you know, I was talking to some of the guys that are really familiar with the story of the discovery of Highland Valley. And they were telling me that these kinds of veins are what they use to vector in on High Highland Valley. <laughs> Setting up for another speech at Roundup soon. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so it's early days for this one, but it's pretty exciting. And Highland Valley, um, any short history lesson there? Oh, I'm not. I don't really know a lot about Highland Valley. Compared I, to some people, some people seem to know it inside out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's a real prize in BC, but yeah, I'm not that familiar with it. Yeah, well, and looking at the topography too of the area that you were working on in 2018. Um, some nice relief there. It seems to be a bit steep on one side, but you're up on the ridge line, ridge and spurs, I guess. This is <laughs> yeah, so the work that we did um, was up on the ridges. Um, and the really great thing about working in mount mountainous terrain is that you can test depth profiles or variations in depth without drilling. So the next stage of work here is going to be to explore the bottoms of these mountains around the edges where there's outcrop along the edges. Yep. Um, and that will give us some idea of how the alteration, the mineraliz mineralization changes with depth. And if we start getting an indication that we're getting into a higher temperature system with depth, um, then that's going to be really proof of concept that this is related to a porphyry system. Wow. And there's some exposure at those lower levels? Ask me next year. Yeah, <laughs> this is it. Wonderful. Oh, <laughs> a great field program to look forward to. How, how will you juggle it all between <laughs> this project and this target? And So we have a great technical team. Um, in 2017, when we started our drill program, I put a huge amount of effort into sort of recruiting some of, some of the best 
um, porphyry geologists to to become involved with with our program. Uh, so we have four uh, project geologists that work for us seasonally, uh, as well as two project managers that uh, work for us pretty much year round now, and. Uh, Last year, we had 100% return of our uh, seasonal technical team. Wow. Uh, and we expect that we're going to have that again this year. Uh, and so we're really well set up uh, in that regards. Uh, and, you know, it's uh, all of those guys two years ago were, were really top employees. Um, but we've been mentoring them for two years, and they're ready to step up and start running programs on their own. Great. And there's a bunch of new really good people that are becoming available as well. Um, so I, I could see that, you know, as the company progresses, we're going to continue to mentor people and bring them up through the ranks. And that's what makes it easy to be able to diversify and do all of these pipeline projects while we're still doing a good job of the work uh, in our main area of focus, the revenue and nucleus well, area. And above and beyond what most juniors uh, attempt, let alone can accomplish, <laughs> continuity is so important. Yeah, so I mean, we were really proud that all of these great technical people wanted to come back and work with us. And I think it's partly because, uh, you know, they love the project. The project is so exciting, and you can't imagine what it was like to be there this year when we were pulling the stuff out of the ground and, yeah. and proving that, you know, our ideas were right. But it's also because we give people opportunities to stretch their limits, and we're mentoring them yep. and giving people responsibility and, and treating them well. And, yeah, it's uh, I can't say enough good stuff about our crew. We've got an amazing crew. I, I've sat in on the AME Roundup Awards a couple years in the past and live tweeted it and hearing people describe, you know, that moment when they came up over the ridge and they saw this or they um, had the hammer out, they banged that rock and they saw that. And I always feel like, oh, I hope I want you guys to have a, a, a GoPro strapped to your cam to your helmet or, or wrapped around your chest or something like that to kind of capture some of these moments on the fly because it's um, it's amazing. <laughs> It is, and there are stories that are few and far between. So it'd be good to uh, good to get some video documentation of it one yeah. of these times. You never know when it's going to happen, though, right? That's the thing. That's why I say just have the camera going. It's, it's you may end up with a lot of useless footage, but if you capture one of those uh, moments, uh, it can't be repeated. Yeah, yeah. You've got to get some of us. With Long in the tooth geos to be as uh, tech savvy as you are. Well, this is coming though. This is with the young people that you speak about, you know, and the, there's a whole wave of things coming to this industry. Um, the innovation hub at the conference this week, pretty neat. See all the virtual reality, augmented reality, and various types of artificial intelligence, all kinds of things people are doing to push the boundaries. Uh, and good to hear from you too. Um, Good old field work, uh, some basic ground truth, this and that, and pulling ideas from the BCGS, no less. Good, good uh, call, staking this ground yourself. Oh well, thank you. And yeah, no, you're right. It's exciting days. There's an awful lot of, uh, awful lot of innovation happening right now, and it's it's good to see all of the, all of the younger geos that are breaking into our industry, um, being so capable with the new technology and ideas and open-minded towards it. I think that's really one of the things that's going to help move move a lot of things forward. You mentioned Gold Corp before. Always lots of questions around that. Um, we'll wait and see how things shuffle out. Um, anything you could say about that at this point in time? I Probably not. I don't know what there sure, is. Sure, I can say something. Who wouldn't want to have Newmont as a partner as well as Gold Corp? Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's, well, and I think they would want to have you guys too. This is, they have their choice globally and exceptional companies with a stable of good projects and good people. It has to be high on their list. Well, there were, uh, there were a couple of Newmont geologists that were poking around our, our core shock. And uh, I can say that uh, at least from the, the geo's point of view, it was all smiles. Yeah. Well, and the front page picture on the deck here, um, stacks and stacks of boxes. 
is that from this season? Uh, you know, that is mostly from this season. Yeah, wow. but that's part of a, a core library that's extensive and includes stuff from back in, as far back as the 70s. Great work. Yeah. Well, Tony, anything else uh, you'd mentioned, everyone? Well, you know, Peter, I thought I'd just uh, point out that, you know, next year we are going to be doing an aggressive drill program. And what we're testing is something very similar to Saul Gold's Cascabel project. We have this very large at-surface hydrothermal system that has high-grade mineralization where there's ground preparation um, from faulting. And all of that mineralization is caused by what we now know must be a blind intrusion at depth. And that's exactly the situation that Saul Gold found themselves in at Cascabel. And then they drilled one deep hole <laughs> right down something that's almost identical to our blue sky porphyry intersections. And they hit the causative intrusion and the mineralization at depth. Yep. And like a year and a half later, you know, their market cap was through the roof and they had a giant gold resource. And we are the only company out there right now that's offering the opportunity to be involved in something like that again. Yeah. We are poised to be drilling a hole just like that hole. So in, a, in an industry that's all about risk reward, there will never be a time when our company will be able to offer the kind of reward that we have to offer this year. Yeah. Um, and you know, in any given district, there has been great success with deep drilling of porphyries. Yeah. And typically it takes one company to have the money <laughs> and the guts to drill one of these very expensive holes. And when they do it and they succeed, all of a sudden there are numerous deposits within those districts that start to follow suit and turn projects that have been worked for decades into mines in very short order. Yeah. And that's what we think we are poised to do. <laughs> Wonderful. Tony Baresi, uh, Vice President of Exploration, Triumph Gold. Thanks very much. Oh, thank you, Peter.